So, hello everybody. Welcome to today's 1715 colloquium by the ETH Library on the topic of openness, exchange, fair data, a oh, brave new world that has such a vision. By Marian Hrutfeld, who will be joining us today uh, by a new technology, our telepresence robot, uh, Double. And uh, this is really a premiere, it's new for us, uh, it's a kind of an experiment and we're very grateful that Marian uh, agreed to join us all the way from the Netherlands via the internet and uh, I hope everything goes right and if not, um, I hope uh, you won't mind it too much and we'll try to troubleshoot uh, as we go. Um, some words about Marian. She is a senior policy officer at Data Archiving and Networked Services, DANS. And DANS is the Netherlands Institute for Permanent Access to Digital Research, Research Resources. It provides expert advice to research institutes and research funders in matters regarding uh, data management policies and practice and provides also support and training in EU projects such as EUDAT and Open Air. She also coaches the participants in the Research Data Netherlands Essentials for Data Support Training. As you know, openness, fair data, this is no longer a vision for many of the researchers. Um, but for many others, it still is a daily struggle. And those new terms like open and fair still pose many challenges. And as we are having the Open Access Week this week, I think it's a very fitting topic and uh, we're very happy to have Marian here to talk to us a bit about her experience on this brave new world of fair data. Marian, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anna, for the introduction. Thank you for the invitation to uh, be the first user of this telepresence robot. I think it's well, in terms of the title of this presentation, very brave of the library and the media center to uh, do this. So, let's see. Um, Anna is the person who will actually um, forward the slides, and you have recognized the, that the title is uh, a quote from Shakespeare. Can you please click again? Um, I think there should be something now on the top half of the screen, the quote from Miranda, or otherwise another click, please. Yes, it worked now. Okay, well, this is what I can't see on the screen at the back of the room, so this is also part of the experiment you're in now. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the slides is we'll now complete. Let's see how this session develops. Um, the idea is, at least, so if you uh, stay on this side, but make, please make the slide full, Anna. Um, the idea is this quote from Shakespeare about a brave new world. When you look at um, Shakespeare research, research, they say that often when this phrase of a brave new world is used nowadays, um, it's meant to imply a positive, if challenging, change. And I think that is a fair quote to use when it comes to open science and fair data. Um, no one has the answers to questions like, what is fair in my particular discipline? Or what is the relevant legislation when it comes to opening up my research output and when I collaborate with international partners? Um, people speak of publishing their data, what is it exactly? And how should we behave when we collaborate with uh, the public sector? And many other questions of this kind. Um, now, I'm not going to address all of these questions, of course, my focus will be on uh, fair data in trustworthy data repositories. But my key message, and I hope it's reassuring, as far as you need reassurance, mm -hmm. no one has the answers. We're all finding out. So, can I have the next slide, please? I will do a brief introduction uh, of dance and open air, and I'll talk about data, fair data, repositories, and in the end it comes together as fair data in repositories. So let's start with the introductions. DANS, as Anna, men Anna mentioned, um, is a Dutch organization with an explicit mission to promote and provide permanent access 
to digital research resources. That can be data, it can be publications or information about research projects. And we're an institute of the Dutch Academy for Arts and Sciences. And our other parent, you could say, is the main research funder in the Netherlands, NWO. Uh, we had some predecessors, and um, the core dates back to more than half a century. We started out as a social science archive. Um, and when I can have the next slide, you see our three core services. At the right hand top is a screenshot of the Easy Data Archive. Uh, it's an electronic archive and system, but in practice it is also relatively easy. It's a certified long term uh, data system. And we made it easy because many researchers want to deposit their data themselves. That's, that was our original business case. Um, on the left-hand side of the top, you see Dataverse. Dataverse comes from Harvard University. You're probably familiar with it. And we host the Dutch version. Um, it's not certified. It's not meant for the long term. Although um, many researchers think that five to ten years is already quite a long stretch. So um, again, this long term is a notion that's not the same for everyone. At the bottom, you see the, the homepage of Marsis, a portal that aggregates information about Dutch research and researchers. Um, so that's a lot of links, not the data or the publications themselves. And apart from these three technical services, we also provide training and consultancy. Next slide, please. My other sponsor today is the Open Air Advance project, uh, a European project, and Open Air originally stood for the Open Access Infrastructure for Research in Europe. We're now in the third generation. Open Air Advance started last January, um, and we're being funded by the European Commission, the Horizon 2020 program. It's not a research program, but it's explicitly um, granted to support the open science ambition of the European Commission. So we support the mandate of open access to uh, scientific publications, and we also support the open data pilot. So one of the good things, um, the, the human things, I think, in open air is that each participating country in Europe also has what is called a national open access desk, that is a person. In Switzerland, it's André Hoffmann. Um, so it's not about technical infrastructure only, it's um, to a large extent a people infrastructure in open air. Next slide please. Open air, like I said, supports the open science ambition. That means uh, we offer support when it comes to open science policies. Uh, we train policy makers for instance. There is this technical infrastructure with all kinds of services um, to link up repositories to the large open air repository with um, millions of data sets and publications um, and also grant information about lots of the projects so it's a very nice reporting instrument and i already mentioned that we support the open research data pilot also when it comes for instance to the legal issues and compliancy and open access to publications so let's move on then to the next slide um, as an example, I know it is small print and I'm not too happy with it myself. We currently released a new web interface for the Open Air Portal, and one of the things you might be interested in is the section with guides, guides for researchers, um, for funders, research administrators, for content providers, lots of online information on all these topics, and for researchers, it's of course about open access to publications and open access to data. So much for open air. Next slide, please. Okay, there is value in open data and in old data, especially. Uh, on the next slide, yes, that's the one. Um, there is some information about what the space agency NASA did in 1975. So in terms of internet and digital data, that's quite a long time ago, um, they were preparing for a Mars landing. And they 
really went out of their way to collect the data and store the data in the best way possible. Um, they had it all on magnetic tape, mm -hmm. made copies of course, um, but only a few decades later they realized that despite the best efforts, the tapes were deteriorating. They couldn't be read well, and the part that could be read could not be um, decoded anymore because the file format had changed. So in the end, now of course this is a risky thing to say, but in the end they were very pleased to have, that they still had the paper data <laughs> version and they typed it all again. Um, they had to retype everything. Uh, at the bottom of the slide you see the links to the currently provided data. So the message could be thank you for paper archives, but actually the message is data management isn't a going concern. You can't, you can do it as good as you can do at a certain moment, but in a few years' time, standards and formats and everything has changed, and we will um, need to update, migrate, convert, and what have you over time. But still, these data are being used, so it's good that they are there. Next slide, please. The Climatological Database for the World's Oceans, you may be familiar with this example. Um, that was an international project at the beginning of this century. And um, what they did was convert shipping log books from between 1750 and 1850 um, into a digital database. Now, of course, the captains in those time had not science on their mind. They were captains on a ship. Um, but they reported the wind and the weather conditions. And nowadays, this is very valuable information for climatologists. So thank you for granting projects like that to convert old documents into new digits. Um, and the thank you goes to research funders. If I can have the next slide. Happy research funders, of course, because this is value for their money. We can spend the public money only once, and if we can make data last longer, the data is spent well. Okay, then move on to fair data. Uh, can I see some hands? Because I can see you, at least part of the room. Um, who has not heard of the fair data principles? Okay. Um, FAIR is actually quite a buzzword, um, and the idea is that research data or research output in general should be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Now, the find and all of these qualities should hold for humans and for computer systems. Now, findability, when you have experience in the library, you know everything about that. So it is describing the data by metadata uh, and so on. Accessibility has also to do with uh, being clear on what someone is allowed to do with the data. Can I reuse your data? Um, are there some limiting conditions, for instance? Um, so that is the core idea of accessibility. Interoperability is basically um, about can I combine one data set with another data set? So can I combine what you have done with what I have done and we draw conclusions from the aggregated set? And reusability is, of course, the ultimate aim, this value for money idea that funders have. Um, can I do more with the same data? Answer a new question, perhaps from a different field of, of research. You probably know, and I mentioned that open science is important. Um, it's good to realize that accessibility does not always imply that it is open. There can be very good reasons to keep data restricted um, and protected, for instance, when it comes to people, when it is dealing with uh, security or uh, commercial interests and so on. So accessibility does not always imply that it's open to the world. Next slide, please. The European Commission endorses this notion of fair data and uh, they installed uh, what they call a high-level expert group, so these are really the top experts, on this topic of making data fair. And last summer, the expert group came with their recommendations. And um, now I am biased because the organization I work for runs a repository, 
Um, so I picked two recommendations that have to that deal with repositories. The first one says that repositories need to be encouraged and supported to achieve certification as a quality marker. And the recommendation 29 at the bottom is that we should implement fair metrics also in the sense that repositories that do hold a lot of data set should publish assessments of the fairness of these data sets when that's possible. Um, so not just keep it, but also signal uh, how fair they are. Now, that is quite an ambition. So, next slide, please. What the Commission also does is require researchers to share their data at the end of the project um, with other researchers or with the world at large, if possible. And not only should they deposit their data in a repository, it should be a certified repository when that's available. Now, certified repositories don't exist in all disciplines at the moment, so again, if you can't find one, that's okay. Um, and what you see at the right-hand side of the screen is um, the guidelines for writing a data management plan, because that is also part of this Open Research Data Pilot. Researchers should write a plan and describe how they will manage their data over the course of the project. So where will they store it? Um, have they arranged for regular backups? How they, will they deal with versions? With whom will they share it? Um, if data needs protection, how is that going to be arranged? And so on and so forth. And of course, the plan itself is not that important, but the, the act of planning and discussing it with your team colleagues is important. And it's actually in that guidelines where the Commission says, we want data to be both open and fair, and we want it in the end in certified repositories. Next slide, please. The Swiss funder, the Swiss National Science Foundation, um, has a similar ambition, like many national funders. Um, research data should be free, accessible to everyone, for scientists as well as for the general public. And like the European Commission, they provide a template for the data management plan. So what I wanted to alert you to, but probably Anna already did, is that uh, at the right hand side you see a part of the data management plan template, and the, the guidance uh, refers to part of these FAIR principles. So that again is linked up to FAIR. Okay. Can I have the next slide? I need to brush up front, so, yep. Yeah. Um, the next slide, I think, reads to publish data also in your own interest. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that, um, I mentioned that, that funders require something of researchers. Um, but making your data open and fair um, has a benefit for yourself as a researcher. So maybe you, when you're not a researcher, this is for the people um, that you support. Um, because there is evidence in some domains that when you publish a paper and you refer to data that is openly accessible in uh, a repository, this paper gets cited more often than papers which just say, in a traditional way, the data are available on request. Now, it is still anecdotal evidence, but it is a nice trend, and uh, this could mean that researchers really um, become more visible and their work becomes more visible when they archive the data in the proper repository and share it with others. So it's not just for the funders' sake that we're doing data management. Um, speaking of these plans, it makes sense to focus on the reuser if you want to uh, consider what data management means. And that's why the arrows in this life cycle point in the other direction than you may be used to. So. Um, the perspective of the reuser can be very helpful to consider, okay, what is fair? What should I do to make my data fair? And how do I recognize fair data? Part of the discussion is that you will need a lot of a documentation. Um, that was from a fair checklist we made in the UDAT project. Um, next slide, please. And documentation starts traditionally with metadata. Um, to find the data and to get a first idea of what it is about. 
metadata is also part of what um, the National Science Foundation in Switzerland um, discusses, and they distinguish between intrinsic metadata, so for instance, the author's name or what the data set is about, any associated publication, and metadata that the submitter should define themselves, so that is the researcher or the research team, and then you can think of definitions of variable names, for instance. So that's not so much to find the data, but to get an idea of, can I use this? Metadata um, is not only for the findability, but also for what are called interoperability, speaking the same language. So it is important that you stick to a metadata standard, which is relevant for your field. Uh, maybe it's a generic metadata standard that you use, um, and repositories can support researchers in that. Um, and if you're really new to the field of metadata, there are some nice sites where you can find examples of standards for various domains. Fair sharing, for instance. Maybe Anna needs to click another time on the same slide. Um, fair sharing provides a very rich collection of standards um, for many disciplines, but it's also uh, good guidance on the value of standards, why you should stick to standards. The Research Data Alliance and the Digital Coalition, uh, the Digital Curation Center, sorry, uh, collaborate on a directory of lots of standards, and they are making a new version, the link is at the bottom of the slide, which not only lists many metadata standards and, and flavors, but also gives an overview of all kinds of tools to make metadata or to validate metadata. So that can also be very interesting um, if you work in this area or if you want to inform your researchers. The next slide, um, which I can't read, but I think it is about documentation. Yes, it's about documentation. Thank you for nodding. Um, that's, of course, another part of the documentation itself, and researchers are often wondering why they should provide more documentation than just the publication. Well, the answer is not all the information is in the publication. So you're probably not explaining all your variables in your article. Um, you will describe your study design, but probably not all the steps and the details, and so on and so forth. If you work in uh, social science research and you do people-related studies, you may have re um, asked for their consent to process the data they provided and the responses they gave. So it's irrelevant that other people know about the consent given and what exactly the consent was given for. Can I do anything with the data or is it very limited? Um, all kinds of notebooks are relevant for others. So machine configurations um, are relevant because if I want to repeat your study, I should configure my system in the same way as you did. So actually, you sh we should think of documenting and preserving everything that is needed to replicate a study. That gives a very rich and very fair data set. And maybe the word data set is wrong. It's a replication package. It's more than data. Next slide, please. Um, I made a slide on interoperability, and I know you can't read all the small print probably so quickly. But what, when you look at the blue text on the screen, you see words like standards, consensus, systems. Um, in the right one, the bottom um, common reference point for comparison. This is basically what interoperability is about. It may sound very nerdy, very geeky, but it is basically speaking the same language, making sure that when you have a definition for blood pressure, and I have another one, we know about this before we try to aggregate our data. So, it's nothing new. Uh, we did it when we uh, wanted trains to um, connect towns and cities and countries, because we needed to be on the same time system, the same measurement system and so on. So, um, it's a human thing, interoperability. Next slide, because interoperability is also a computer thing, and it is also related to sustainability of the data. You see here a list of file formats. Um, it comes from uh, our dance archive. It's only part of the list that we have. 
And we have so-called preferred file formats. Those are file formats where we are confident that we can sustain them in the long run. Um, because there is a, sometimes for, uh, because there is a very large user community or because there are open formats and so and so, there are some criteria that all long-term repositories use to say, okay, we understand this is maybe not the format that you work with, but we need this for sharing with others, but also for keeping it alive over time. Um, different repositories may have different preferences based on their expertise and on the domains they work for. Um, so that is an extra reason that researchers should contact a repository of their choice at an early stage of the, uh, the project to find out if uh, they should comply with certain <laughs> formats or if anything goes. And of course, these lists change over time as well. Next slide, please. So we're really digging into repositories now. And on the next slide, Anna, I can't read it. Is the title Selected Trustworthy Repository? Yes. Good, thank you. Um, <coughs> repositories and archives used to be considered as places where you store something and that's it. We see it as a link in the data life cycle. So it's both for archiving and for reusing. Um, so for giving and taking, you could say. And um, there are some criteria you can keep in mind. Uh, and stuff that a trustworthy, a certified repository typically does. So when it is certified, it has been assessed by external reviewers against criteria. Um, it may mm, provide some information on file formats, on access regime, so open or partially open or on certain conditions, and it will help you to uh, add the licenses that make clear what you can do in a later stage with the data. It will support metadata standards, at least generic ones like Dublin Core. Um, it will also provide a um, so-called persistent identifier. And we know that many researchers are not yet familiar with persistent identifiers for data, but they are very common for publications. The DOI is a well-known persistent identifier, and we also have DOIs for, for data sets, and there are other flavors of persistent, persistent identifiers as well. So, that is what a repository does for you. It can provide guidance on how the data should be cited by reusers. And if there are any costs involved, usually not, um, they tell you upfront. So yes, there are reasons why you would look for a certified and trustworthy repository if you're interested in uh, handing over your fair data. Next slide, please. Um, in the European framework for, certified, for trustworthy digital uh, repositories, there are three levels at the bottom. There's a core level, um, and the certification scheme there is called the core trust seal, and it really has some core criteria, only 16. I will tell more about the core trust seal in a minute. The next level um, is the Nestor seal, um, that, kind of, that goes with a uh, DIN standard, uh, preserved by the German DIN Institute. And on top of that, the most demanding certification scheme is an ISO certification. Um, and that's really different. That is based not only on a self-assessment, which has been reviewed, but then a full audit team comes to your organization, opens your cupboards, and wants to talk with your customers. So that is a bit heavy. But the core trust seal uh, is feasible for all kinds of also smaller um, repositories. So that's a nice one. And on the next slide, you see where these repositories are located, roughly. So there are many in Europe and in Northern America. Um, you see both um, core trust seal certified repositories and data seal of approval and world data systems, because core trust seal grew out of the other two. The other two started independently. At some point, they realized, hmm, we have a lot in common. Let's collaborate. And that ended up in the core trust seal. And because a seal or a certification 
is valid for a couple of years. What you now see is a mixture of a slightly older data seal of approval and world data system certifications and new core trust seal. And in a couple of years, all this will be core trust seal, and hopefully many more than the 160 that we have now. Next slide, please. An example of a repository with the core trust seal in Switzerland is the World Glacier Monitoring Service. It's based at the University of Zurich. Um, and you can see in the data menu on this on screen that it provides guidelines, for instance, guidelines for the submission of glacier fluctuations, for a measurement of glacier front variations, for mass balance terminology, all things that I don't know anything about, but for the domain, this gives good guidance on what is expected to keep up the standard of good data within this repository. Um, they do have a data policy too, which is also a very great thing to have, and it is all public and transparent. Now this ties in nicely with the requirement number eight of the core trustee requirements on the next slide. Um, what you see on the slide is the majority of the requirements for core trust seal. And in blue, you see all kinds of terms that relate to fair data, licenses, ongoing access, compliance with disciplinary and ethical norms, and so on, long-term preservation, relevance and understandability. So it's not literally the fair terminology, but there are clear links between what researchers do to make the data fair and what repositories do to keep the data fair. So we're all in this together, is my message, as you understood. Mm -hmm. Next slide, please. Um, alternatively, if you can't find a core trust seal um, certified repository, you can look in read three data, and then I advise you to use the filter called certificates and really look for repositories that have this red icon signaling that it uh, is certified. There is some mismatch with the core trust seal. Um, we are working on it, but all these efforts are um, unpaid, so don't expect a perfect match yet. But you will find 2,000 repositories across the world in read free data, so there must be something for anyone. Let's move on to the next one, because if you're on your own and you want to know more about licenses, we have the UDAT licensing wizard that helps you to select a license for data, but also for software. I'm rushing a little because we're running out of time and there is this upper all at the end. Um, so you can use the standalone version of the licensing tool, but it's also part of the B2Share repository. Next slide. OpenAir expects me to also promote the Zenodo repository. Are you familiar with that? Some of you are. A little, okay. Um, the good thing, I think, of the Zenodo repository, it's, it's casual. It's completely generic. It's for data, it's for publications, it's for intermediate reser results. Um, and it is free up to a certain amount of data, which is also a good thing. It is um, hosted by CERN. Um, which in itself is a kind of quality seal, but it is not certified yet. So we're pushing CERN and Zenodo to get this certification, as you understand. Um, and because it's uh, a fundamental part of open air, you will also find support for um, granting information, which of course the European funder and other funders appreciate very much. On the next slide, you see something that is not there yet, but it is in the making. Science Europe is the organization of the European research funders and research uh, performing organizations, and they have a working group on research data. And this working group on research data is preparing criteria for the selection of trustworthy repositories, because all funders believe in that. Um, and the idea is that this will help researchers to ensure their data is fair. Um, it is very well aligned with the criteria for core trust seal, but it will not end up in a certificate. It's even, it's actually a more core than core trust seal, you could say. And um, Science Europe will probably recommend and stimulate that repositories do get certified in the next few years. 
So this is a trend um, we will see. Next slide. How it comes together, the fair, da the fair data in repositories. Um, the next slide gives some basics about how we would assess the fairness of data. Now, that is a tricky thing because fair as a concept is new. Um, many data that is in repositories wasn't supposed to be fair in a literal sense. Of course, it should be good, but it was good. So um, there are no very strict measurements. But a very nice way to explore it for yourself is just go to a data repository and look at a data set. Would you be able to use it? And if not, why not? So what would help you to trust that kind of dealing? Because it all boils down to trust. Um, and if we want to do this not in a personal way, but in a more structured way, the question is who should do it? Researchers, data managers, archivists, um, Anna, if you can move to the slide that is called Go Fair Metrics Group. Yes, it's on now. Okay, thank you. Um, this is one of the two initiatives that I want to introduce that wants to define metrics um, on how, to what extent online resources, say data, comply with the fair data principles. And the image is quite complex, but the image at least suggests there is a tool. <laughs> um, it also mentions communities, which is a very important stakeholder in data management because computers, uh, communities um, know about their field and will have a say in what counts as usable. Um, and uh, because it is still in the early stages, I think we leave it at that and we move to the next slide. Um, I have a couple of more slides on this one, but here you see an, a prototype that uh, my colleagues at DANS are developing. We call it a light assessment. And actually, um, our director was inspired by online booking sites where you just have stars to indicates the quality of something. You can score something and it gets one or more stars. So applying that approach to um, data in a repository, the idea was, okay, um, can we define findability in terms of one to five stars? Let's say when the, the data set doesn't even have a persistent identifier, well, it won't deserve more than one star. If it has a persistent identifier, but very, very insufficient metadata, well, maybe two, and so on. Um, building up to five stars. Well, you can do that for findability aspects. You can also do that for accessibility aspects and so on. So that is how we tried to come up with metrics. And when you then move to the next slide, you see mm -hmm. a batch. Uh, remember, it's a prototype, it's not, it's not live. But what we thought was, Okay, fair, um, when we summarize these 15 data principles, we can say fair is actually a kind of fitness for reuse. How reusable is it? And can we have a batch system that simply indicates as a kind of extra metadata the level of fairness of a particular data set? So in the image you see, okay, three stars for findability, two for accessibility, four for interoperability, the colleagues noticed that it is very tricky to come up with good parameters for what reusability means. They have been shuffling all these uh, principles and they said, okay, actually we think reusability is the result of the other three aspects. So that's what you see in the middle of the slide. And that's also why the, the stars be on top of the R have a different color. The reusability would be the average of the other three aspects. Um, the link to the prototype is on the slides. You can still use it, but we are thoroughly redesigning it because we got feedback that it was way too much effort um, and that researchers wouldn't want to use this. Okay, now that, of course, is devastating feedback, but very useful. Um, and we're working on a next version, and we hope that it will be as easy as uh, a booking site on the internet. <laughs> Maybe not, but okay. Um, on the next slide, you see an indication of what it could look like 
in any repository because it could run everywhere and like I said, as a kind of extra metadata to indicate the use, the fairness, the fitness for use of a particular data set. Okay, to sum up, it is all about trust. Um, and you can interpret the image like you want. Are we taking a big leap or um, are we still on the safe side, someone holding our hand? Um, Anna, if you click until the slide is full. Um, there was this earlier slide with the data life cycle in a larger way. I think um, we should all aim for a fair aligned research data life cycle and maybe we should really focus the core trust seal logo on this preservation stage um, to remind us that although we call it the research data life cycle, all stakeholders should be involved and in particular the repositories. People who find value in existing data and who make valuable data should be credited. Um, that's not a new idea but it's part of fairness and open science. And there are all kinds of things we could do, and I encourage you to do, that you can read on the slide, and I don't have to tell you. Um, and that actually is my take-home message. Thank you very much. And if you have questions, you're most welcome. Well, thank you very much, Marian, and thanks also to the audience for your patience and understanding with the slide technical problems, um, which is why it also took a bit longer time now, but I think we still have time for uh, one or two bigger questions before we continue on to the upper row and continue also the questions there. Everything seems clear so far, but maybe I will have one question then uh, before we continue on. Um, so where in your opinion is um, the main point where we as support staff from the libraries could or should help actually researchers in um, accomplishing all these uh, requirements that they're thrown at them from various sides? Um, well, I think it also depends. Do researchers already come to you with questions? Actually, they do. Actually, they do, but they're, they're very broad. Or let's rephrase it, maybe. So, um, when researchers come to us uh, with questions, they're sometimes insecure about the, what the requirements really mean, and we need to translate them uh, so that they're more understandable. So what have been your uh, experiences with uh, training researchers, supporting researchers um, at Netherlands? Uh, where, where are the biggest pressure points there? Um, we get many questions about the costs. Um, because, one, and I think they mainly come from uh, the data intense studies. Um, so the idea that um, you have to pay for long-term preservation and long-term access, um, many researchers are actually scared that it will cost them a lot and that has not been budgeted for. Um, I think in practice, many of them can trust the data to uh, a repository and don't have to pay for it because it is considered a kind of overhead cost. I don't think that is the good term, but that's how it used to be libraries and repositories and universities just provide storage place and uh, repositories but still especially because the commission and other funders say your costs for data management are uh, reimbursable as long as you budgeted them so this now signals for researchers okay we need to have a number up front when i write a proposal so that's where they're concerned um, other concerns about the legal issues often um, what is a license? Where do I find it? Can I share it with someone? Um, we now have this European uh, GDPR uh, on the protection of personal information with all the national implementations um, and countries um, that 
are supposed to have, how do they call it, equivalent legislation, if it's not effectively the implementation. So that's a new topic. Um, what can I do with personal data? And I think you can, uh, your support staff can do a lot um, by reassuring researchers that when you make plausible in your data management plan that you did your best to give a good answer, and that is okay. Especially because, like I said in the beginning, no one has the real answer because there are no real answers. All this is in flux. Exactly. So um, that's in a way very reassuring. Actually, you disappeared from us again. Here you are. Um, but that's nice to hear because it seems that all over Europe we are dealing with the same questions and the same topics because this is also what we are seeing from our researchers. Uh, the questions about long-term funding of the data, publication and preservation especially, and the legal issues which are um, often um, unknown to them or strange or they're just not their topic unless they're working in specialized humanities, politics, law areas. But since we're here at um, uh, in a STEM field uh, institution, the obviously the, the researchers are insecure about these topics. So uh, what we are also indeed are trying is to uh, reassure them that um, actually it's not that bad as they might think and that we are also trying to help them with these guidelines, with these trainings, and that we're also pointing them to the right um, professionals at our institute, like um, a transfer office for regarding patents or the legal office regarding uh, legal questions. So that's what we're trying to do here as well. Yeah, but maybe sometimes it really um, helps to stress the fact that there are so many differences between the disciplines um, astronomers, to give an example, um, are used to sharing and they have very strict protocols and they have very strict definitions and standards because their machinery is so expensive and their research is so expensive that they can only do it by sharing. On the, on the other end of the, the other extreme, for instance, um, in, in history research science or in social sciences, you have people working alone. So for them, um, this whole idea of uh, interoperability, of um, the technical expectations of um, machine, the machine aspect of fair principles is quite new. So then I think it's good to um, stress that yes, it is an ambition, but it doesn't mean you have to do it next year. Yeah, as, as a field you should exactly. grow and develop and not as an individual researcher. So exactly. And this is also what we're trying to tell them that actually uh, you as a researcher are, are an expert in the topic and you as a community need also to get together and uh, discuss where the issues are and also then communicate them higher up and to the funders so that they in the end can adapt to your needs because I think it's a very fluid process and uh, everybody is still learning. And this is what the message we also get from the Swiss National Science Foundation. So uh, it's nice to see that reflected elsewhere as well. Yeah. yeah. I think you can take the European Commission very literally. They still call it a pilot, the open data pilot. And they welcome feedback and they welcome information about uh, what is challenging or what is unclear and so on. That doesn't mean that they're going to change their policies immediately. But exactly. um, I think that so the, the people we're dealing with are really interested in getting feedback. Yeah, there needs to be a dialogue. So we have a question here. Yeah. Uh, I have a lot of questions concerning the right tools to create fair data. I think it's not difficult to uh, create a PDF A document and to uh, store some metadata in this document. But it's very difficult for, to create a standardized uh, um, uh, XML Data. There are no editors usable for a normal researcher. It's very complicated to use the tools. Is there a, 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 a development in this uh, area? Um, I missed part of it. I think your question was about tools to 
um, about uh, about it, no? yeah, about exactly about tools to uh, create fair data, which goes goes beyond just simple PDFA. For example, XML editing, exactly editing tool. Like, um, do you know about any tools, or do you have recommendations for tools for, for example, for XML, right? Yes, for historical science. For historical, science. yeah, social sciences. Yeah. Okay. Um, no, I don't have it immediately, but I can ask and let through Anna know if I can find some recommendations for you. Okay. There are profi tools like Oxygen, but it's impossible that a researcher handle this. It's a complicated user interface and uh, I think the main problem is to, to prepare uh, user interfaces or tools, editing tools, to create fair data. It's the main problem, as far as I <laughs> think about this. Okay. Um, and what... Okay, this is not an answer to your question, I know. This is uh, more uh, stalling, perhaps. Um, how do you see the trend um, for work towards data librarians and data stewards who would offer their services to the researchers? So not to expect it of researchers to do this, to, to generate the XML, but some specialized... No, I don't think it's an issue for a library. I think it's a an, an, uh, question to produce fair data and to have a support for the researchers to create this kind of data. I'm not sure about uh, it. Uh, it's, it's possible for libraries to give a support. I'm, I'm not sure about it. Probably, yes? I don't know. Well, I'm not sure either. So from what I've seen, um, research data support offices um, differ hugely. So some really come from the IT department. Uh, others come from the library. Sometimes they're new um, staff organizations. Um, and depending on where they come from, they may offer this kind of service. But that's not your question. You've asked about tools and support for researchers to use the tools. Well, I have no um, way forward answer for you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, so if there are no really pressing answers at the moment, I suggest we continue our discussion and dialogue outside, com accompanied by some nice apro, uh, to whom you're, everybody is invited. And uh, I want to thank Marianne once again. She'll be present remotely uh, outside for a while as well to answer any questions if there are. And uh, with that, I'd like to thank everybody once again.